going to call it the waiting room. Velvet? Um, can you hear me now, Velvet? Yeah, I, I got you. Can you try again? Okay, so you can hear me? I can. Oh, okay. I saw a text to, to the contrary. So, okay, great. All right, welcome everybody to the October 19th uh, town board meeting. And um, so we are going to begin with a public hearing and then we have two guests after that and then we'll proceed to the meeting. So um, we'll be taking privilege of floor until after, after our guests. Um, so with that, I will start the meeting with the pledge to the flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I will open um, the public hearing on the uh, battery energy storage system siting law. Um, and I do want to ask if if, um, if anybody on this list signed up, meant to sign up for the public hearing. Okay, great. Thank you, Beth. And um, so you mean I'm, I'm confused. Sign up for the public hearing? For the public hearing on the battery energy storage lock? No, I just have one question. That's it. About that? About the public? No. Hearing? Oh, okay. So, uh, Beth Harrington. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Clinton Roll Volunteer Fire Company. Um, I have previously sent a letter to um, Town Board Member Hal Snow and asked if he could read it into the public record, but I guess that's a no no. So, uh, this is a letter that was sent to Cal and to the other members of the Town Board regarding the proposed. Um, regulations. We uh, I'll just say we did receive it, Beth. Thank you. Dear Cal, thank you for sharing the proposed town resolution um, on the battery energy storing units. On July 24th of this year, members of the Slaterville Volunteer Fire Company, along with members of the Brookendale Fire Company, attended a training on battery emergencies and electrical storage units conducted by the New York State Office of Fire Prevention and Control. This training was eye-opening in many ways, especially with an emphasis on the inadequacies in fire resources and capabilities to handle such a fire, and that safety technology in these systems are dangerously insufficient. Very shortly after that training, a best fire did catch a best a battery storage unit did catch fire in Jefferson County, which further emphasized that rural fire companies do not have the resources needed to attack these fires. It is also noted that the degree of toxicity of the runoff from best fires has not been thoroughly studied. In Jefferson County, deck guns on fire apparatuses were used continuously, and I say continuously, for six days. Um, and as a matter of fact, deck guns can flow from 500 to 2,000 gallons per minute. Even pumping at just 500 gallons per minute, that is 720,000 gallons per day, or over 4 million gallons in six days. No built containment structure as in your proposal could handle that amount of water. We strongly urge the town board to, number one, 
put a moratorium on both the proposed resolution as well as the building of any best units until such time that a workable action plan can be developed. That the town and two, that the town board members take the same OFPC course that we took so as to truly understand the dangers inherent in these systems. And three, that the guidelines of NFPA standard 855 be incorporated into any further proposals. In addition, we, the fire company, have asked the Department of mm -hmm. Emergency Response to develop a county-wide plan for dealing with such fires. Additionally, the governor created a new interagency fire safety working group to ensure the safety and security of energy storage systems across the state following fire incidents at the facilities in Jefferson, Orange, and Suffolk County this summer. It might be prudent to await the outcome report of this group before proceeding. And again, I submit this on behalf of the fire company. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Um, we see Bill Padalka has his hand up. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yep, go okay. ahead, Bill. All right. Um, so basically, I'm going to speak in favor of the uh, resolution, um, but I'll come to the moratorium question in a second. Um, uh, you know, there are definitely a few odds and ends in, in the law. Some of those have come up, I think, in the last week or two, um, clarifying a few uh, intents in a couple of places, maintenance of clearance areas, perhaps addition of setbacks that I think you guys will certainly discuss tonight. Um, I urge you to pass this law and separately you can consider a moratorium. Um, the rationale is that this law covers both small, we call tier one battery systems and larger, which are called tier two battery systems in the law. And even if it was felt that we should have moratorium in the larger systems, I think it'd be important to go ahead and have this law in the books to cover the smaller systems. Um, those are the actual ones that are likely to be built in Caroline. These are residential um, or commercial, like a single building, a, a single business size uh, facilities. Having the law in place has a certain amount of consumer protection. It will make sure that the um, battery banks are built safely, which will help both the emergency responders as well as the owner of the facility. And also gives some uniformity as this is closely based on um, the state um, sort of permitting uh, example for a, a smaller battery system so that um, developers will have a more consistent set of, of regulations to pay attention to. And that too should benefit the consumer by, by lowering costs. Now, I do understand that the, the planning board took very seriously the issues of fire safety associated with battery energy storage systems, that are, you know, large ones. And, um, and we did meet with a couple of the fire chiefs, and I understand that there may be additional information now based on the training they went through. Um, I have no particular problem if the, that town board would like to install a moratorium on such larger systems, uh, perhaps to wait for the governor's task force to issue a report. I think the the practical import is negligible um, in that uh, given the amount of three phase power lines in Caroline, et cetera, it is very unlikely a large battery energy storage system is going to be built anytime soon. So on the one hand, you could not have a moratorium and it probably wouldn't be a problem uh, because there won't be one built uh, most likely. Uh, or you could have the moratorium and also really won't cause a problem because it's not like there's a lot of developers chomping at the bit uh, to build these and, and you know, going to uh, sue the town or whatever. So uh, that really is up to you either way. Uh, I will point out that an acre foot of water is 326,000 gallons. So um, I disagree with the statement that was read that no built containment system could handle the kind of runoff she was talking about. I am extremely concerned about the runoff. And so that would be handled during site plan. Um, I think that indeed uh, a, a several acre area impoundment could be designed that could handle that kind of runoff. And I certainly hope that it, it is done if that's what is required. So anyway, I, I speak in favor of the law and, and I guess I am agnostic on the question of whether a moratorium uh, is placed. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Any other comments on the uh, battery energy storage law?
Okay. With that, I will close the public hearing. Um, and we will be discussing this uh, during tonight's business meeting. So with that, I will um, welcome Sheriff Derek Osborne, who has uh, offered to come speak with us tonight. And let's see here. He's in Zoom land. Zoom land. Uh -huh. Virtual chair. I can hear you. Uh, I can't get my video to. I'm working on it, Derek. Oh, Sorry. Okay. About that. All right. Wanted to make sure it wasn't on my end. Great. Now, let's see. I think you should be able to open your video now. And if you have anything you want to share, you could share a document or. Is that working? Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Hey, welcome. Hey, thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me tonight. Uh, I was asked to give a quick overview of the Sheriff's Office operations and some things uh, we have in the works. If, if that's okay, can I share my screen? and? Uh, you should be able to. Great. That'd be okay. great. Hmm. All right. Um, I, I tried to come up with a few slides that would give you a general idea of how we operate and what goes on at the sheriff's office. Um, I, I didn't want to bore you with a slew of slides. I, I could easily talk all night. Uh, we got a lot of good things going on. Um, I'll just start with a quick organizational chart. Um, we've grown pretty uh, dramatically over the last uh, five or six years, um, I'm pleased to say. Uh, where we were lacking in a lot of areas, especially road patrol, we've really been able to uh, gain some new positions. Um, a lot of it has been through uh, savings I realized in the budget that I inherited when I was first elected. Uh, we were able to do a lot of work in managing overtime in <clears throat> what I feel was a much more effective way. Uh, we were actually able to fund uh, new deputy sheriffs that way. Um, in addition to that, the uh, legislature has also granted me uh, additional uh, positions. Uh, you'll see mainly that we uh, operate in four uh, major uh divisions within the sheriff's office. Um, the really the only true administrators are myself and the under sheriff general and um, and then everybody else underneath us is uh, pretty much union members uh, of the rank of uh, lieutenant uh, and in, in corrections it's actually a, a captain but we have our criminal investigations division that's the first one on the on the left that's run by a lieutenant and six uh, investigators. Uh, and then our Uniform Patrol Division, which is our road patrol, um, again, a lieutenant. And then we have six sergeants, uh, two on each of the three major shifts, seven to three, three to 11, and 11 to seven, and about 26 uh, deputy sheriffs um, underneath those sergeants. Uh, they're split up amongst the three shifts, um, which, like I said, is uh, we have about 26 of them, um, and uh, they work on a rotating basis. Uh, our administrative division is our, our civil division and, and records. Um, that is where all our civil processes uh, come into play, evictions, uh, income executions, uh, things of that nature. Um, that other, Just that in corrections is actually only New York State mandated um, operations that a sheriff uh, is uh, required to have or a county is required to have a sheriff to do. Uh, believe it or not, road patrol is not a, a, a mandatory uh, requirement under New York State law. <clears throat> this is uh, the patrol zones, how they're uh, broken down. I thought that would be an interest to see where Caroline uh, falls. Uh, we have four uh, uh, patrol zones. Uh, the first one, 325, is Groton and Lansing, and then 326, which covers Caroline. Um, is the entire town of Dryden and uh, Caroline. Uh, when I mentioned the 26 deputies, by the time you split them among three shifts, 
uh, and have days off and time off and things like that. Uh, I'm routinely uh, left with uh, three or four deputies uh, patrolling the county at, at any given time. Uh, if we were down to three, we have one assigned to 325, uh, one to 326, and then the third one covers all of 327 and 328. So we cover a lot of area uh, with very limited resources. Uh, due to the positions I was able to get uh, through our own doing and through the legislature, we're trying to um, bump that up a little bit. Uh, ways to get around uh, not having enough people in all places at all times. Uh, in the last few years, uh, as you may know, we uh, created substations or satellite offices, uh, one in Newfield and one in Enfield. Uh, and that helps us get deputies uh, down near the southern area of the county in the west side a little quicker. Uh, they report right there at the beginning of their shift and they uh, maintain uh, routine off office hours at each of those locations. Uh, a lot of things we got going on. Uh, it seems like we're doing uh, more than ever. Uh, two of the biggest things is uh, we just created our crisis alternative response and engagement team. Uh, that was done in partnership with uh, Whole Health. And what that does is provide us an alternative means to respond uh, to people uh, experiencing a crisis or a substance abuse issue. Uh, there was a lot of uh, demand from the community to come up with alternative response methods uh, that didn't involve uh, law enforcement responding to certain types of incidences. Uh, so that's something we came up with. Uh, that pairs uh, a very experienced deputy sheriff uh, with a mental health clinician from Whole Health. Uh, that team just started um, within the last few weeks. Uh, so far, uh, very good. Um, on the right of the screen is our sheriff clerk program. This is also entirely new uh, within the last year. <clears throat> uh, we have a division now within the sheriff's office that handles certain uh, non-emergent calls um, without dispatching a deputy uh, to the scene. Uh, these involve uh, calls that uh, involve a person actually showing up to the sheriff's office and reporting a, a complaint or just simply uh, the types of complaints that have routinely fallen on law enforcement that uh, don't need a, an armed deputy to respond to quite frankently. Um, that has been a huge success. We have two positions for that. We only have one filled right now. Uh, we're waiting on the civil service list which should come out anytime uh, to fill that second position. Um, down at the bottom, uh, SHIELD, we've also started uh, a lot of work to have our first ever uh, terrorism task force. Uh, SHIELD stands for Stop, Hate, Interrupt, Extremism, and Link Disciplines. Uh, I think we've had about four or five monthly meetings so far. Uh, we invite uh, certain stakeholders within the community uh, and different organizations that uh, uh, facilitate conversation, basically, and uh, try to bring information to light that maybe we uh, weren't sharing with each other before. Uh, down the road, we will have a, a reporting portal if somebody in the community has a concern or, or catches wind of something about to happen terroristic uh, related, uh, they can uh, fill out a report online and get it to all the uh, people involved in this uh, care team. Um, a lot of talk has been going on about um, uh, violent crime. Uh, as you may have seen in the media, uh, New York State uh, recognized uh, more the city of Ithaca as opposed to the entire county uh, and identified them uh, for a grant uh, called GIVE, Gun Elimination, uh, Gun Involved Violence Elimination. Uh, and it offered up $382,000 to combat uh, violent crime and crime related uh, to use of firearms. <clears throat> uh, the city of Ithaca, uh, namely IPD with their staffing issues, uh, weren't able to accept the grant, uh, so I worked with Albany uh, to get those funds diverted to the county. Uh, and we've been working on that a, a little bit. But a lot of people lately have been asking about violent crime, and here's just some numbers uh, to show the reality of it. And this, again, is just City of Ithaca and what I used to uh, get those grant funds. You can see in the last few years, uh, violent crime has gone up slightly. Um, and violent crime is defined by the state as murder, rape, robbery, and felony assault. Um, so it's not everything that uh, is often considered uh, violent crime by uh, people in our community, uh, just uh, through state regulations. Uh, this is a slide of uh, uh, property crime, uh, again, in the city of Ithaca. And I know I'm speaking to the town of Caroline, but um, 
by uh, being able to get those uh, funds uh, converted to the city or to the county, um, we're able to do a lot of things that uh, would help eliminate crime, not just in the city of Ithaca, but countywide. Uh, so it's been so far uh, very good. Um, those funds have been used uh, to implement hotspot policing. Um, that's basically uh, just trying to identify where most of these violent crimes are occurring and focusing in those areas um, and engaging the community there to try to come up with solutions uh, to, to prevent the uh, crime that they're seeing in, the, in their neighborhoods. Uh, we are working quite extensively with the Ithaca Police Department on this since most of this type of crime is occurring in the city. Um, and so far, it's been very successful. We made uh, some good arrests out of it and, and diverted a lot of uh, issues that could have been a lot worse, uh, for sure. Uh, a good majority of that uh, money uh, is going towards uh, flock safety. And this is a real neat thing that will benefit everybody in, in Tompkins County. Uh, it's a license plate reader camera system that picks up on license plates. Um, we're going to have uh, approximately 52 of these cameras dispersed throughout uh, the county um, with several in the city of Ithaca. And what it does is if we have a gun involved incident um, or a major crime uh, and we have a vehicle description, we can potentially identify that vehicle through these cameras. Um, and in just a note, these don't pick up on people. Um, we're not watching people. Um, they simply uh, gather uh, license plate data. And these license plate readers have been used for years. Uh, we have them in all our patrol vehicles already. Uh, these are just stationary mounts. And the neat thing about this system is other jurisdictions within Tompkins County is also utilizing flock safety. Uh, Cornell University is looking at this system, uh, Cuga Heights PD, and uh, jurisdictions like Elmira uh, already have them in place. And uh, using this system, we can actually connect uh, our, our uh, software platform uh, with places in Tompkins County and places such as uh, Elmira. Um, so if we had uh, a gang-related uh, shooting happen in Ithaca uh, with the idea that the suspect came from Elmira, we could potentially uh, track that person from Elmira into uh, the city of Ithaca. So a lot more to come on that. Um, lastly, uh, big things we get, had going on, uh, we just uh, got reaccredited in our, in our corrections division. Uh, the New York State Sheriff's Office uh, Association puts on a voluntary uh, accreditation program uh, where we have to meet certain standards through our policy and procedure. Uh, we just received that uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but even bigger, uh, our law enforcement division, our road patrol, uh, has never uh, been accredited uh, in such a way. Uh, again, it's a voluntary program with road patrol. It's done through the Division of Criminal Justice Services. It's much more extensive. And it's uh, something I was involved in trying to make happen going back to at least 2002. And uh, it looks like we're finally going to get there. Um, it's been a lot of work. Uh, our assessors are coming uh, this next July and uh, we'll have everything in place then. And, and uh, it'll be quite a historic moment for our, our office. Um, if I have time and, and you'll entertain me, um, I just we just finished up a video today about our care team. It's about three minutes long. Am I okay to show it? Great, that'd be, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> And this has not been released yet. We literally finished it today. So you're you're the first ones to see this. Take a welfare check. 84 year old female, colors a daughter, says her mother is making suicidal and homicidal comments earlier today. So far, the trip dementia. Caller who's the daughter is not on scene but is available by phone. The Tompkins County Sheriff's Office and Tompkins County Whole Health have partnered up to handle mental health crises in a more innovative way. We currently have one mental health co-response team, which includes a very experienced deputy sheriff and a mental health clinician, responding together in a special vehicle to mental health crises calls with an objective of de-escalating a situation and diverting the person from the criminal justice system, if at all possible. My name is Rachel Webb, and I'm the clinician on the care team. 
Um, I started working in the human services field over 20 years ago in this community because I like to help people and help the community. This co-response model, I think, is great because it pools the resources, the knowledge, and the approaches of both law enforcement and mental health to help de-escalate somebody on the spot and to connect them with the resources they need to move forward without uh, just being sent to the hospital or, or getting charges. Um, and I am excited to be a part of this team. Deputy Barber, County Sheriff's Office, part of the care team. I have 18 years on in law enforcement. I decided to, to be a part of the care team so that I could take the time needed with individuals in crisis and really listen to their stories to see how we could best fulfill their needs and get them to the proper community agencies and resources that they could utilize. I really like taking the time with those that need us, paired with a mental health clinician to really find out what's going on and how we can better serve them. They have a broad array of responses that they can provide uh, to people, including uh, assessment to determine if somebody is in an immediate crisis situation and, and needs support uh, at a hospital. Uh, but more likely, they're going to be able to identify community supports that can uh, help the individual with uh, the situation that they're experiencing that is resulting in a crisis at that point in time. I ran into these lovely ladies and one of the worst days of my life. And when everybody was trying to be rough and tough and manhandled, they sat me down, talked to me, asked me questions and helped me clarify the situation. And I felt better and I've been moving forward ever since. But we definitely need more people like this that want to understand the situation. Research also indicates that individuals who receive services through a co-response model are much happier with the services. There's a high level of satisfaction. They really feel heard, respected, and cared about. So it's a different type of response. There's a lot that has gone into making sure people feel safe uh, because there's a different uniform that's used. The vehicle is different. The team is clearly marked. They have a different role. Uh, the care team came to my house on a day when I was great emotional overwhelmed. Um, they were amazing. At a point where I needed someone to hear me, sit with me, help me figure out what my next steps were. I had the most amazing heartfelt experience from both Rachel. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I just bombarded you with a lot of stuff. And and quite frankly, it's everything I just shared has been in the works for the last five years. Uh, very busy, a lot of good programs going on. Um, and what's nice about the alternative uh, response mechanism uh, that we have put in place, either the sheriff clerks or the care team, um, it's really gone a long way in freeing up our road patrol to handle more uh pressing issues on the road, uh, uh, citizen uh, complaints and quality of life type uh, issues. Um, and that coupled with the additional deputies we've been able to put on, um, I feel like we're really moving in a, in a more positive direction. Well, that's really great. That's, uh, that looks like a great program. Thank you, Derek. I, um, are you ready for some questions from the board or? Absolutely, sure. I don't know if they have any, but I'll <laughs> anybody have any questions for Derek. Uh, well, it's really impressive. And it's uh, be interesting <laughs> to see some of the numbers specifically about our town at some point when, you know, if you have some time on your hands, you can deal with those numbers. Um, and, um, because, uh, yeah, I, I was surprised to find out about that, that you said that you're not mandated to help, you know, with the traffic and the speeding and everything, because that's the only, I mean, giving out tickets is the only way we can have safe streets to, to walk on or bike on or drive on. So yeah. just wondering, where does that fit in with your time? 
Yeah, uh, actually, um, you're not the only town that experiences traffic related issues. Um, one thing I fought hard for is when the reimagining public safety recommendations first came out, um, it was re recommended uh, to have us stop all traffic enforcement uh, in the county. Um, I, I knew that was a bad idea. We were able to get that recommendation uh, removed. And part of uh, moving and obtaining those six additional deputies, um, now granted, I got the positions right now, we're waiting for our civil service test. I have four deputy positions open on our rope, rope patrol, but the intent of that was, uh, part of the intent was to create a, a traffic enforcement division uh, so we could take some of those extra deputies and set them aside for traffic enforcement um, throughout the entire county. Uh, Cause I do recognize that it is an issue. Um, you can recall from me showing you the patrol map that we technically uh, or most often uh, only have uh, one deputy assigned uh, to the 326 zone, which is all of town of Dryden and all of town of Caroline. Um, so in between answering calls, um, it's very difficult to take on extra traffic enforcement duties. Um, so that is the biggest reason why I'm trying to create this uh, division within the sheriff's office uh, to set aside it at a minimum two, possibly four, um, to work strictly on just uh, motor vehicle collisions and traffic enforcement. Uh, we're expecting our civil service list um, to come out any time, um, and then we'll move forward with filling these positions. Right now, I cannot create that division until these positions are, are filled. Derek, how do things coordinate with the New York State Police? Yeah, we get along really well with the New York State Police, and I'm glad you brought that up because uh, what would be helpful to me is um, if I had some input uh, provided to me if there's specific areas uh, where traffic is a concern, um, times of day, uh, days of the week and, and times if, if there are any, uh, where the problem is uh, increased. Um, that helps me direct patrols into that area. Uh, and also, um, I can take that information and share it with my partners at the state police uh, because they have uh, several new recruits coming through the academy are going to be trained uh, out of the Ithaca office. And uh, New York State Police, as we all know, do a lot of traffic enforcement. So any information I can get to you to help me direct uh, direct me into the right areas, I, I will be more than happy to share it with them as well. That may be going to be a trend. The state police are going to do traffic enforcement, and then you're going to have... No, we, we all do traffic enforcement, but the uh, state police statewide is is known for doing traffic enforcement, so they do quite a bit of it. Uh, we write a lot of traffic tickets uh, every day. Um, but uh, we don't have the capability of having a, a specific traffic uh, division uh, handling that type of work outside of routine police calls that we uh, receive throughout the day. Um, but that can change uh, once I fill these last four positions and co can create that unit. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when the funds were first given to me through the legislature to uh, add more deputies on for that purpose, uh, uh, we lost a lot of staff uh, uh, during the uh, reimagination process, or at least during the beginning of it. Um, a lot of retirements, people went into different lines of work, and we lost nearly uh, an entire shift uh, worth of people on the road patrol. Uh, now we're in a good spot. We're uh, completely full uh, to the level of what our normal uh, staffing levels are. Um, I just need to fill those last few positions uh, to create that unit. Derek, I think it's a tough job. Thank you for what you do. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a tough job, but it's I, I love our community. I love serving as sheriff. And uh, if you guys wouldn't mind, if you have, have specific complaints, uh, please uh, let me know uh, the roads where you're seeing uh, most of this. If it's everywhere, uh, you can tell me that too. So Yeah, but that doesn't help you if we just say everywhere. You need to specific... <laughs> <laughs> ask a, a follow-up question. Um, I'm wondering if you um, are in communication also with County Highway. Um, when we submit, for example, requests for road assessments, would you be notified of that or is that completely a separate line of communication? 
Yeah, we work uh, closely with County Highway, but to be honest, we don't receive those notifications at the Sheriff's Office. So, so that means that we would be wise to send them to you as well. <laughs> If you'd like to, I'll certainly take a look at it and at least at a minimum gives me an understanding of what issues you're seeing uh, so I can be aware of it. Uh, oftentimes, uh, I've written letters to help uh, support uh, applications for studies and uh, mm -hmm. reduce speed and things of that nature. So I'm always open uh, to doing that if it makes sense. Great. Oh, that's that's great. Yeah. Great. What? Um, that was a good question. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if this is allowed in New York State. Can, we, can you have like the cameras that take pictures of people speeding? <laughs> well, technically, you can Happens legal. In some um, yeah, it's not it's not uh, beneficial to us because we have to be able to prove who the operator of the vehicle is. Uh, just having a description of the vehicle or a photo of the vehicle, unless we can positively identify the person that's operating at that time, uh, it, it wouldn't be uh, helpful to us. And in most circumstances, for us to issue a traffic ticket uh, for that level, uh, we would have to observe the uh, uh, the violation as well. That's great. All right. Any other questions for for the sheriff? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Derek. I I, I just really appreciate you. Uh, Coming out and uh, and giving us this uh, this update and overview, it's exciting. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely, anytime. Uh, please have me back, and uh, if you have uh, you know some input on what you'd like me to talk about when I come back, I, I can uh, okay probably do that. Great, Great. thank Everybody you. Have a great night. All right. Yeah, you yeah. too. All right, that was wonderful. Um, so. Um, Next, we have um, Ryan Garrison here. Welcome, Ryan. He's with Hunt Engineering. He's been working on the broadband feasibility study for us. And um, so, yeah, so we, um, just to summarize, you know, if, if you've been following the town board actions, we've been uh, pursuing a path to investigate um, building out from, from Dryden's project for a municipal broadband uh, project for Caroline to fortify um, broadband access in Caroline and control costs or create an affordable, um, affordable um, option for people. So um, you may, some of you may have done the survey that we sent out. So the report that, that Ryan's going to summarize tonight is based on survey feedback from Caroline residents. And um, so anyway. Um, now, is there a place where people stand when they present here? Um, anyway. Yeah, you can you can stand, you can just face the audience right. and yeah, I'll yeah. pull up your presentation. Yeah, does that work? Let's do it that way. Okay. Yeah. Um, can I be a little bit interactive here? Do you guys want sure. no, 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 no. Yeah. How many people here have internet? Mine was right. out today. Okay, well, that's what I was going to say. How many people here are happy with their internet? That could be. I'm signing up for the new guys that are coming through. Nice, who's that? So, uh, the guys from Clarity Connect. Clarity yeah. the fire out. Points for my something or other. Yeah, points for my man now. They get their, uh, I concluded that would be an improvement of the spectrum. Yeah, that, yeah. Depends on what your issue is. It could be speed, it could be price. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that today, but that's that's basically the topic of discussion today is is internet and the availability to it, and you know also I think cost is a big part. You know, a satisfaction. Um, you know, we did a survey of the town's folks. We'll talk about a little bit here, um, but what I'm going to do is just go. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, more uh, about the town itself. Uh, the demographics of the town, uh, things that would be uh, have been you know. To the point of broadband and uh and then i'm going to get into a little bit of what we're doing up in the town of drive as uh as an example of what we might be able to do here um and some uh interactions that we might be able to have with the town of drive and save everybody some money um so i guess if we just uh next one yeah start with the first slide here so I don't mean to regurgitate too much information you guys already know, um, but these are the these are facts that kind of pertain to broadband um, the way I think about it. Total population, 
Uh, you have about uh, 3,300 people here. Uh, there's a total area of 54 uh, square miles. Um, just as a comparison to drive, and we'll do that a lot today, they're about 94 square miles, so you're roughly half the size of them. Um, but yeah, you have six, you know, uh, 1,455 households, which is you know roughly one quarter of what they have. So just in comparison, you know, size-wise, you're about half half their size population or house household wise, you're about one quarter of what they have. Um, we have about 2.3 people living in each household, so that that comes into play when you talk about how many devices are connected. And you've got a poverty poverty rate of uh, 3.8 as of uh, 2022, I think, is where we got this data. Um, all of those things come into play, whether you're going for grant funding, you know, whether you're eligible for grant funding based on poverty rate, uh, whether you have so many people per square mile, it uh, deems that you're eligible in your rally. Uh, so all these things kind of come into play. Um, on the next slide, we have some goals that we were thinking about. <laughs> you know, uh, we'll get into uh, the survey we did, but we thought, you know, provide high speed internet and affordable costs was a, was a good goal to have. Uh, serve the unserved customers. So customers who do not currently have sufficient broadband. When I say sufficient broadband, we're basically talking about uh, better than dial up and in my opinion, wireless or satellite too, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, provide the best service feasible. I say feasible for a reason. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there available, um, but I think certain technologies provide certain feasibilities over others. Uh, and I want to spend public dollars on, on a public service. You know, something, in, any public money that's, that's put into something, I think it should be uh, a sustainable investment. It should be a long-term investment. And it should provide the public a valuable service that they actually recognize. Um, one of the cool things to see up in Dryden is uh, many of our new customers up there never really had much interaction with the town other than paying taxes. So to see them come in with a, a valuable service to them that they actually see every day and interact with is, is uh, new for a lot of people. Right. Can, can I just, if, if you guys want to grab a chair so you can see that, we can pause well, for a second. I said maybe some of the people want to get a chair oh, so they can see the. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Oh, okay. Um, now, as far as demographics go, uh, age wise, you know, you've got uh, roughly 85% of the um, population is of what you'd say is heavy internet users, you know, from uh, all the way from. Uh, you know, kids are using devices earlier and earlier. I have a three-year-old at home and I'm trying to break him up at night now. Um, all the way up until 64. And then even uh, individuals over 64 now are heavy users of technology. Um, if we skip down to the last category, actually, you can see that really uh, as of 2022, only about seven people had no technology. 7%. 7%. 7% yeah. had had. Um, really no technology in their home. And we kind of saw that in the survey too. There were a couple of them. I'm sorry, I don't understand those top numbers there. So under 18, 23.3% of what? Of the population. Of the 3,300 people in town of Carroll. Yep. 23% are under the age of 18. That's right. Okay, so that's good. so that doesn't in any way correlate to internet availability or usage. You're just- No, no, just identifying- That's the sensed data. Yep, exactly. Okay, thank yep. you. That's right. Um, income per capita, uh, $42,000. I think it's slightly above Tompkins County's average. Uh, but, um, you know, I think where that comes into play is how much is it reasonably uh, reasonable to ask someone to pay for internet out of their household budget every month. Uh, median household income is $82,000. Uh, technology usage. I mean, this is just stuff everybody knows, but 93% of uh, uh, households have uh, more than one device going. And 87% uh, uh, of those households actually still use laptops. So now we're still talking about Wi Fi and, and internet of some kind. Okay, and the next slide. Next, I'm sorry. Okay, so some takeaways from those demographics with regards to the broadband stuff. 
number of households per square mile is relatively low. You know, so when we think about feasibility of different stuff, uh, different options that you have, you know, you, the more households, the better. Um, so that was a little low. Uh, over 85% of the population, like we said, is in the demo that, that uses a lot of technology. Um, per capita income is going to indicate we need an affordable service. And like I said, 93% of the population is using multiple devices in the home. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, no, I'm really that. confused with these numbers. I'm sure other people. Could you could you let him just finish his presentation? Yeah, I, I'm not confused. It's, so you're not confused. I'd like to hear the presentation. <clears throat> Very well. Very well, wait a minute. He asked this to be interactive. Why can't he ask the question? Why don't I just ask it rather than all of us argue about whether I ought to be able to ask it or not? Sure. So 93% of the population has multiple multiple devices in the home. So that would indicate to me that 93 or more percent of the population has at least one device in the home. That would indicate to me a fairly high rate of connectivity in the township. Is that a correct conclusion on my part? Yes. I, I think he's going to get to that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for helping me. Yeah, sure. Anyway, um, and Ryan, you're okay with questions during yeah, the yeah. presentation? Or yeah, yeah. It's up, yeah, however yeah. you'd like to do did it. I, did I answer your question? Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm confused down the line to let that go. I mean, you did answer my question, and I thank you for it. Sure. And I certainly thank the town board for their indulgence. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we surveyed uh, the residents and we got a, a pretty decent uh, response from all the residents. We got roughly 9% of the population that responded. Uh, my int the interesting takeaway I got from that was the average cost of internet for folks was $78. Uh, you know, I've, we have, I, I saw a pretty common spectrum, seven, 80 to $85 package um, that we that we saw there. So. 83% uh, of respondents said they would be interested in a better internet service than what they have now. Um, and costs seem to be just as much of an issue as anything else. Um, and that, I think that kind of speaks to your question about overall connectivity. Um, yeah, yeah, it does. I, I, I was under the impression that large swaths of the town were not served at all or grossly underserved. And these numbers seem to be like that. That's why my confusion. There are. Uh, when they say under unserved, that means they just don't meet a, a threshold for speed set by the federal government, which is 25 megabytes download by three megabytes upload. So they have some connectivity and they have devices in like the DSL office, kind of thing, but they're struggling to get yeah. Or or um, satellite is another one, and that right. that gets really cost prohibitive too. So um, that's the correlation there. Now the existing broadband landscape here to continue down that path a little bit. Spectrum's a big player in Caroline. Uh, Frontier is here. There's a little bit of Verizon. Uh, Points Broadband, who is formerly Clarity Connect. Uh, I have a good relationship with those guys as well. Um, they're, you know, uh, I'm not sure how far their expansion is down into Caroline, but they have some. Points? Points. Points you're asking about? Yeah, I know they're they're right here near the town hall. Yeah, So now, now they do a mix of fiber and wireless so there's a uh, you know you kind of have to know on what mm -hmm. is being purchased mm -hmm. um hateful connect uh they're a formal cable provider but now they do a lot of fiber um i think they're out of spencer uh also a good relationship with those guys and and they have some presence in the county or in the town i'm sorry um Hughesnet is a satellite provider uh and starlink is also a satellite Um, so, is anyone here familiar with the Rural Electrification Act of 1936? I think that's right. Yeah, 1936. Uh, so, this is the example I give to everyone because everyone wonders, you know, why is it so unfeasible to get a wire to every home when when there's power everywhere? And you know, I, I had to go back and do some research, but essentially, you know, uh, there's an act passed by Congress, you know, in 1936, and essentially it used a combination of public, private. Uh, cooperatives. This is where a lot of the cooperatives sprung out of that you see around uh, upstate New York. Um, 
they all banded together and they figured out how to get plant out to every single farm, every single household. And essentially, you know, that that's how we got to where we were today. And it was, it was a, a, essentially some subsidization by the federal government. Um, and we're seeing a little bit of that today with broadband, a lot of that today with broadband, the federal government has programs, the state has programs, um, but I'm sure it was a lot easier back then to get access to that money and to meet, meet the requirements of the program. Um, they're much more picky today. They used to string wires from trees. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They didn't overthink it, I think. That no, they, they, it. that's the word for it, yes. Yeah. So what is municipal broadband? Uh, municipal broadband is nothing other than buying internet in bulk and serving it out to uh, residents, much like water, wood, or uh, municipal electric. You see some of that in upstate New York. Um, and really it's just municipally owned infrastructure that delivers a broadband service, internet. Uh, there's multiple ways to accomplish it. Some of them have different levels of risk and reward. Uh, and I always take the approach of, you know, I'm trying to, this everyone versus anyone is more of a concept of uh, water sewer districts where you see um, a special district be put up and then basically you take all the residents in that district and you divide the cost by everyone in that district and everyone must take that service. That's not really what we're doing. We're going to build the service and we're going to sell it in a competitive market. So it's, much, it's, it's a little bit different than that. Everyone must have it. It's anyone can have it. Um, and then competition exists. However, what we're finding out right now, and, and you can see it happen in the marketplace all around you right now with Points Broadband and, and Hayfleet Connect. They're changing their systems to turn them into a more fiber to the home system because they're easier, they're cheaper. Uh, there's no power components in between the head end and the home. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a lot less maintenance required and they're able to go in and compete with these less agile, big providers, you know, the, uh, the spectrums of the world, the frontiers of the world, while they try to get out there and improve their plant and upgrade it, they, they could never replace their whole system because they've got too much to, they can never go in and put in a fiber to the home plant. They don't have a green field to work with. They have a brown field, you know, they, they have, but they're, I don't quite understand. Can you elaborate? A brownfield uh, in the industry is like uh, a system that's already been built, so you have to work within the constraints of the existing system. In a greenfield, you really have nothing. So you so you can, you're able to put up uh, an infrastructure that can serve multiple purposes and is more current. Okay, so this is interesting. For example, point is coming down Creamery Road to my house, mm -hmm. and and at least one neighbor. Yep, and. Spectrum's already there. Yep. So unlike the power company, it isn't like, well, we already got a power company, but now a new power company is going to come down to a POI. I mean, that's maybe the nature of power distribution is so much more costly per unit distance that that just is completely unfeasible. Whereas in this instance, it is perfectly feasible for competitors to run down the same geography. Am I... Am I getting that right? That's exactly it. And then okay. it comes down to, can you provide better than the guy that's already there? Okay. You know, and, and I think that's kind of what I'm speaking to is that um, you wouldn't see companies like that making investments right alongside Spectrum if they didn't think that they could go down and take their customers. So what did, what would, why would that prevent Spectrum? When you talk about the brown field, why would that prevent them from saying, okay, we're going to bite the bullet and do fiber ourselves because once we got it in place, now we can beat these guys. Yep. It, 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 you made it sound like there's an inherent there behind the eight ball somehow because they've already made the investment in yeah. older technology. So this gets really in the weeds, so please ask questions if none of it's clear. But um, so Spectrum has with their coaxial network, do you know the different like coaxial? Yes, I do. Uh, so coaxial network is in what's considered an active network. Uh, you have to power components along the way, amplify the signal, and you know, so they have power components all along the whole uh, plant that they have. Okay. Um, and to switch that up and go to a passive plant is, is prohibitive for them. Yeah, and and as many places as they can. Now that doesn't mean that they haven't moved to a fiber system, but their fiber system is an active fiber system. So they're gonna while they're gonna make many improvements on their brownfield, 
uh, they're going to have distinct disadvantages when it comes to power outages. You know, like if a power outage happens for us, we have one place in the whole in Dryden, for instance, we have. Yeah, I can talk about this with you after. Yeah, sure. I'm still okay, sorry. I can, I can talk about it all day, so I can really get going. Yes, very good question. That's interesting, though. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank um, you. Yes. Can I ask you a different question? Sure. Um, are you talking? There are two basic costs here. One is capital. Yep. To install whatever equipment, wire, whatever it happens to be. The other is operational, That's right. which is the monthly fee to the user. Yes. Which are you addressing, or are you addressing both? Both of those. Okay. On the capital side, <laughs> we're already paying for some of this to be done. We pay it through our phone bill. We pay it through our TV. We pay it through our cell phones. Um, it's called the Universal Fund. Universal it's Service. Federal, yep. federal Fund. Mm -hmm. And there are billions, billions of dollars collected each year. Some members of this town board have heard me talk about this. And when I was on the county legislature, we actually were able to secure some funds. And they were, at that time, it was a three-legged stool to provide funding for companies to provide service that was healthcare related, the underserved schools and libraries. Mm -hmm. About five years ago, they put a new light in a stool called broadband. Mm -hmm. We all pay a percentage of our current bills. If you ever wonder what that niggling the dollar amount is on your bill, it's for the universal fund. Um, when the county, when I was on the legislature, when the county accessed that, they were able to get funding to sprinkle it around to the various entities mm -hmm. who use it. Even hospitals and the healthcare arena are eligible. Yep. Hunt Engineering, if you're going, if you proceed with the town board's involvement, if you proceed as a developer, you're eligible to, to apply to this fund just like Frontier Communications, just like Spectrum, um, and any other hateful or any of the rest of them are. And some outfits did apply to this fund and, and misused the money. Mm -hmm. Frontier, in case some of you aren't aware, Frontier received $17 million in order, to, in order to enhance the broadband. We never saw any of it. Mm -hmm. And some of us tried to find out where the money went. And then, then Frontier, under the old model, declared bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. uh, this was about five years ago, four years ago. So I would encourage you a lot. Oh, yeah. If, if, you, if you're probably aware of this. Yeah. Uh, and I can actually speak to that whole frontier. I mean, so the, the, it, the universal services is required and, and, and they pay out money in many different ways to, to different things. Like, for instance, schools and libraries, okay. uh, they have category one and category two. They'll buy equipment. They'll, they'll pay for the service at a library. Like, uh, like in Dry and Fight, we were going to go to uh, the library downtown. And essentially, as uh, an E-rate eligible provider, they get a discount on their service as a rebate. You know, check to them. That was, that's like one way to do it. And then the problem with that is all that extra money that they put into the broadband stuff, the frontier that you were just talking about, went into a program called ARDOF and CAF, Connect America Fund, all through the FCC. And FCC has never run a federal program for broadband funding that has been amenable to anyone other than like the frontiers of the world. Um, you know, so me as a municipal broadband guy, you know, I do work with private service providers, but um, even they don't even dabble in those types of money. It's just, it's almost like specifically carved out for the spectrums, charters, uh, the same company, uh, Frontier, Verizon, all those. Things. So um, you definitely, and, and I think when we get to the capital part of it, 
I talk about some different things and of ways to pay for it, but ultimately what you have to do is you have to constantly seek funding, especially with the broadcast. So if you have could, to, you, could you say that last part again? You have to constantly seek funding. You have to take it wherever you can get it. You have to look at it as infrastructure. You have to look at it uh, at grants that don't necessarily say broadband. They might say economic development. They might say public infrastructure, um, but you have to constantly look for that money to lower that cap because essentially your operating expenditures that we're also going to talk about, you have to leave room for any debt that you have to incur to put the network up in the first place. Well, I'm glad you're aware. Of yeah. it. New York City a couple of years ago also added a surcharge to our phone bills and cell phone bills. It's a small amount. You'll never feel it. But when you figure you have 8 million people paying it every month, it's a lot of money. Yeah. And if they consider it a surcharge on our bills, which is a little bit of a poke in the eye. Yeah. One last item on funding, and then I'll move on. But uh, no, I, I think I, I think the big opportunity, though, is with the state of New York. They, they were given all the uh, federal infrastructure bill money. Responsibility. And now it's their responsibility to trickle it down. And I don't know if it's going to go to the local economic development entities to then distribute out, but they're, they're, the program's going to trickle down like that. And I think for uh, a town like Caroline, those are going to be the good opportunities because when you get into federal programs, they're also very competitive. You're against huge programs out west and in Alaska. And, and so I'm sorry. No, no, you're okay. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Am I on the right slide? Yeah. yeah uh, so uh, municipal broadband, yeah. the publicly owned infrastructure and reselling services. That's all it is. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, one way, one approach of this, and and I'll be the first to admit, uh, I'm very proud of the project in Ryan, but I'll be upfront about the things that I would do differently this time um, because I'm very uh, improvement oriented. Like I, that's the only way that you're going to get through this stuff. Uh, Right now, the Dryden Fiber is actually part of the town. Uh, I think in hindsight, uh, what we could have done and we probably still will do is create a local development corporation. It's basically like an LLC for a municipality. Mm -hmm. um, it separates you guys a little bit from that. Um, it, and you know, I think if you do some immediate research, you see like a comptroller's report about how you should not do these because they don't comply with all the requirements for purchasing and this and that. And, that's not the point. The point is to limit, you know, the connection that, you know, like uh, it needs to operate as a self-contained entity um, that, you know, you guys can oversee. Um, but, it, you know, if it's if it's dependent on the board, um, you know, I don't know how long it's going to live. You know, like you want to make sure that it's a long lasting thing that can benefit the public for years to come. Um, it's essentially a private not-for-profit entity specific to local governments. Um, and you know you can develop a specific charter that's more geared towards uh, someone who's going to provide services. So what are we actually talking about? So fiber to the home is essentially a way of hooking up customers with fiber optics. Uh, the limit is basically seven miles, and you go through what's called optical splitters. And this is this is what we this is what I said on do end up in drive and do differently than what you'll even see points broadband do. They go one fiber to one home, uh, no matter what. And there, there are some benefits to that, um, but what it does for them is it increases their equipment locations. They have to have more equipment than we do. In Dryden, I can have two equipment locations and I can serve the whole town. But we have, we have three. By equipment, you mean what specific? Uh, a pedestal with, uh, the, it's like a data rack. And then it's got like a network switch in it, which kind of looks like the one at the bottom. Okay. So, uh, and those are your points of failure, right? Power can go out, uh, even though we have it backed up. Um, the equipment itself can go bad, you know, all kinds of, so the less of those, the better. Mm -hmm. And um, so so that's why splitting the fiber is a good way to do it. And, it, and it's not like uh, degrading the signal, like it would in, in, in uh, like a copper cable. Light is either on or off. So you run multiple frequencies or that's exactly right. So the the thing on the bottom shoots out light in a bunch of different wavelengths. 
Mm -hmm. And the thing on the other end decodes it. So, so one home is one wavelength, the other home is the other wavelength, and it goes through an optical splitter and basically broadcasts the signal. And that's how I always thought fiber worked. You guys from Portland were telling me how they do it differently. I wasn't quite able to sort. Well, that they out. see what we do, and they like that too. But uh, they just yeah. have a totally different network. And it's not that one's better. You know, there's you know the other thing is if a tree falls in the woods. I'd rather have to fix 48 fibers than 144 fibers. That makes sense. When you go one for one home wise, your counts get really high up in the rural areas. So, you know, you're either going to have more equipment or more fibers and neither one. Back to me, maybe we can talk tech stuff. Cause yeah. I have some blanks I'd like filled in. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But the tree still makes a sound. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, and then, uh, and what, what's basically <laughs> happened is, is uh, the equipment's caught up, and now you can do massive amounts of bandwidth to one port. So basically, we serve like I serve thirty-two or sixty-four customers off one switch port that does ten gigabytes. Uh, you can do up to like one twenty-eight, but you know that's for more dense environments. When, you, when the way we design it is distributed splits, you're going to have splitters out in the you know closures in the field, you know, and then they're going to cascade. So. A um, little technical, but, um, and then on top of that, to make sure that you know your network's up. I mean, when you when you have an outage, you know, your customers, things go offline and usually your techs see it before the customer even sees it. Um, but there's other ways to shoot lasers down the, the, the fiber to make sure that if a tree does fall on it, you know right where that tree happened and it text messages the guy who's supposed to go fix it. You know, like um, the big thing with municipalities is, you know, we don't, we don't have the time and effort and the people, so we have to put in these automated processes to try to improve our situation. Um, if you go to the next slide. So this is our high level design of uh, Caroline at the moment. Um, like I said, we, we, we figure we need about two equipment locations for this. It's more about capacity than distance. We could probably put one right square in the middle and serve everybody right from that one cabinet. But if you have two, you can they can fail over to each other, you know, and and um, then not everyone in the whole town is out when your cabin's up, you know. Mm -hmm. um, not like that has even happened in Dryden yet, but um, you know, you just try to design around these points of failure. Um, right. Mm -hmm. Does that take into consideration the topography of Caroline is is not exactly flat? <laughs> if you have a few hills here. Well, I did fiber. <laughs> Yeah, it's wireless, you're gonna have problems, you know. That, that, so so for me, I think when I think topology, I think it's more of a challenge with uh with wireless and trying to make those connections. Uh for, for fiber, that's the way you get past that challenge. Yep. Um about 64 miles of what we consider distribution fiber, uh to equipment locations and so so here's where things kind of uh get to the interaction with Dryden. Um, I'm sitting here, you're talking about OPEX, operating expenditures. Dryden has the same burdens that Caroline would have if they did it, but we're right next to each other. Their network's going to touch your network, and they can sell you broadband just as easy as uh, they buy it from someone else. And that right now they have more than what they need. So why don't we share bandwidth? You know, why don't we come up with an intermunicipal agreement to make it cheaper for everybody? Share and, and that, that can trickle down, you know. So we'll talk about the business model in a minute, but you know, we can share some costs here. And I think uh I think we can between the two communities uh really get that operating expenditure down because that's really your riskiest thing. You're, you know, you're gonna start getting those bills every month and customers are gonna come on and they're gonna come on slow. Um, and that's another lesson that I met from uh that I learned from Dryden is uh building utilities is hard work and you know uh it it does take time and you know that's going to slow up the customer bring on the customer so in in your pro forma that i did for this project like the business plan um i really took that into consideration about a conservative approach to how many customers you're actually going to take on um, i do believe Dryden's going to get to the take rate that they think they're going to have um but i don't think it's going to happen immediately like our immediate take rate there is 20 percent we'll go into a, a place and we'll take 20 percent of customers right away but then you know it's going to trickle up to 30 then it's going to trickle up to 40 and then it's going to trickle up to 50 you know 
that that's a little bit of an unknown, but it will get there. Um, you know, we see certain like cul-de-sacs that we built out. Uh, there's a couple of cul-de-sacs where we're like one household away from taking everybody in a whole house and a whole cul-de-sac, but then other locations, it's just neighbors don't talk to each other as it must be. So, um, and then it gets into the whole market. But uh, I think the piece here is that uh, there's a lot of opportunity for some shared costs with driving that would just... Um, could be mutual benefit, mutually beneficial, but honestly, I didn't figure any of that sharing into the uh, into this particular business plan. So, if you go to the next slide, uh, actually, uh, you don't have to go back. But one of the other lessons that I learned from driving, and, and you'll see that is uh, build less in terms of cabinets. I built uh, cabinets and I built a uh, prefabricated hut you know, just for their project. I don't think we need to do that. Hindsight, fire departments, town halls, you know, these spaces are just as good as any, you know, I mean, why, why build a whole separate structure, uh, grade the land, do all that. So I think that from that sense, I would do that a little bit differently as well, just because it brings down costs, you know. Yeah. Sure. And they're, they're really small, right? The yeah, they're really small. They don't take much space. And I do think we have some pictures in here. So we'll eventually yeah. see them. Um, so, it's, so how do you run the network? You know, uh, the initial construction is probably easy enough to guess that you do that with construction contractors. You know, there are people who run fiber, who splice fiber, and who hook everybody up. Um, the biggest question for us was who's going to answer the phones 24-7? Who's going to answer the phones? Oh. Or, or support customers if they, have, if they have issues. And what I learned from other providers locally is not everybody even does 24-7 service, which is kind of strange. I can call, I'll, I'll leave the names out of it, but you can call them after five and leave a, and you have to leave a message and then they call you back. Um, and we found a we found out we talked to other providers and we found who they use. You know, I went, uh, I won't say who the provider is, but I, I, I just found out who their customer service subcontractor was because I knew they didn't want to pay people to answer the phones 24-7 either. And I found a company in Phoenix. So they're working Phoenix, uh, New York. So upstate New York. Um, so they're working, uh, they're working on the driving project and I kind of see the same thing. If we could work a deal with them to split the customer service costs, uh, the number of customers is still under the thresholds that they gave us for their quote. Can we work a deal to split that cost as well and, and uh, lean it up even more? Um, and then they also, that same company manages the networking equipment. They'll both dial, they dial in, they tell you if there's an issue and they even come on site to install new stuff, make some edits. So we kind of touched all our bases on how you'd support that network. Um, and then customer billing was another whole thing. And there's tons of companies that do that. We just settled on this like uh, Stacks bill. It's just the name of an app and it manages subscribers. For you. And, that's and right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Um, but I don't think that's a huge cost. So, you know, you guys could even pick your own thing, however it worked best for everybody. Um, as a matter of fact, I probably wouldn't recommend, not not that I don't recommend Stacks Bill, but, you know, finances would probably be better separate, you know. Um, yeah, so so basically just a subcontractor model and, 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 you know, you need interaction from the town board, you need a management component and I think that's where the local development corporation comes in and somebody who you know if that's a small three person board or however that gets oversaw um I think that's how you interact with that group of subcontractors. Like for driving we have a bi-weekly meeting. We have a couple of bi-weekly meetings. We probably meet too much. Um where we're meeting with all the different stakeholders in the group, moving construction forward and talking about operational things too. So um, this next slide is probably just a quick one, but uh, we found it huge to be partners with the people you're working with. Make sure that they have a stake in the game, like uh, um, the equipment contractor that we're working with. They want our project to succeed because it'll be an example for others. Uh, and I really leverage that. Um, I also want to find local subcontractors. The, the guy who uh, manages our network and answers the phones, it was critical for him to be in New York State. You know, I don't know how we could have done it any other way. Um, but furthermore, if you have installations that need to happen, 
uh, why not hire local people to do that? Uh, you know, we use Clarity Connect, which is the old points broadband, like they, their old companies around and still does installs. So we hired them to do it because they know how to do it. Um, but, you know, there was a conversation about uh, the local electrical contractors and if we could get them involved, and that still may be the case. Um, but we needed to get going, so. And, yeah, and the town of Dryden is really the example of that. You know, we try to source everything local, work with everyone local. So this is a little hard to see, but this is the capital expenditures. Uh, what we're calling the central office and the branch office are old telecom terms for basically our huts or our equipment locations. I can't read it. Oh, okay, yeah. You don't have to. So both of those are about $24,000 a piece. And all, and that is, that's the shave down cost. Uh, those cabinets cost much more than that. So that, uh, that's an attempt to get that uh, upfront cost shaved down a little bit. Um, the networking equipment, we estimate at $210,000. However, I think that's high. That's just a healthy estimate. Um, transport cable. So this is the backbone, what we'll consider the backbone cable or high count fiber um, that connects the two cables and also serves customers. Um, that's $286,000. Um, and then the distribution cable, and this is all for phase one, what we would consider like the first upfront uh, year of work. Um, the distribution cable would be about $774,000. So the total of that phase of construction only cost would be $1.2 million, uh, uh, $1 million, basically. Um, now with phase one, what you'll see is, you know, with, with the operating costs and the lack of customers and the construction costs all going out the door, I think, Another lesson that I've learned from Dryden is I would have done Dryden a little bit differently too. Um, we built about 20 miles of network and set up all our cabinets before we served any customers. And we felt like we were setting up the foundation of our network. It was the right way to do it. And all of those things are correct. Um, but, you know, first off, our business plan didn't have patience. And uh, and customers don't have patience. You know, the, the people hear about the project, they know what we're providing, and then when some customers get it, it becomes even more of a problem because then they talk to other customers, and you have people calling from all over the town saying, "When am I going to get this?" And that's not in a bragging way; that's in a you get pressure from every different direction way. So, um, I think the tempering of expectations is huge, and I also think that the capital construction projects in the beginning and and uh, trickling them out in a smart way is the best way to do it. Like, um, you can correct me on the name of this because I'll probably butcher it, but Boise. Boiseville. Boiseville Cottage. Yeah. You know, and, and this is just me looking, you know, as a, as a, uh, a local guy, you know, who drove through there and saw a lot of houses. Um, but anytime I think like that, you go to, you know, how, how much will it cost us to just go to there? Because that's 200 customers right there. And when I have in my pro forma where I figure 50 customers are going to sign up in year one, you know, if you can get a hundred customers in year one, the pressure really is, is, is off, yeah. you know? So uh, that is not really figured in it. This is just more generic phase one, phase two, phase three. This is how I would do it, but I would reevaluate phase one and come up with like a, a minimalist strategy to start to get that revenue coming in. Mm -hmm you know, with as little building as possible. And then and then from there, it really just takes the pressure off because, you know, it's about how many customers you pass. Because once once they see the value of your service, they'll sign up. That's not the issue. The issue is getting to them in time. You know what I mean? Uh, in, in time, you know, in a relatively reasonable amount of time. Sure. Your numbers strike me as very optimistic. Um, the reason I say that is- Because I've done a couple of these this way. We, you said there are about 1,400 households. Yes. And you also said that over 90% of the residents in Canada, or we kind of households and residents, I'm not sure about Households is what I look at, yeah. Um, over 90% of them have some sort of service. That's right. And some of them have better service than others. Now, the folks who already have good service may or may not be inclined to jump ship to go to you. Um, it seems as though, you know, you talk about first year, you get 20% and after a while, while we're up to 50, that just strikes me as overly optimistic because you're coming into an area that is 
if not quite saturated with the existing service, has quite a plethora of it. Yeah, so, so um, competitive advantage. So that the competitive advantage that we have is speed, price, and medium that matters. It'll be our, our ability to upgrade services at no cost. Yeah, to the town to fund the infrastructure though. Right. I mean, that, that does give you, I mean, am I misunderstanding this? I mean, isn't this a pitch for the town somehow or other that ultimately We're looking for outside funding. We're looking to get money from the infrastructure bill. Right? It would be helpful for me yeah. if I could, if we could finish the presentation yeah, so we have the overall understanding of well, okay. what I mean, you know, yeah. he's been taking yeah. questions right along. I when, he, when, he, when he takes them from me, you guys get pissed. I hope that's not hurting you, Ken. I haven't, no, I haven't asked no, any no, questions no, no, no. for the presentation. But uh, yeah, I, how would you like to pursue? See, I, I think yeah. time. It's eight thirty, and for so the board, it would be helpful to have the presentation. Yeah, but, uh, how about I um, just try to get through it, and then I'll ca definitely catch up with you right after. Okay, and, uh, and if and I'll also yeah. give you. My I'm going to raise a personal objection just for the record, if anybody's bothering to keep a record here. But thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. So capital construction costs. Um, and I actually separate uh, customer equipment and customer install costs because we don't know what's gonna happen yet. And you don't wanna incur those costs until they physically happen. So uh, you can project tape rate for one year, set that budget aside. And if you exceed it, then you're gonna be in good shape. You know, uh, or if you approach that budget, you're gonna, you know, revenue wise, you're gonna be in good shape. Um, and then you have to just project out in, in the upcoming year. So that'd be like a yearly budgeting item of what you want to put towards that uh, each year. And, ho and hopefully by, uh, I, I can't remember what year, this will be in the report that's delivered. Um, but you'll see a break even year where, um, depending on how this thing is financed, which hopefully as little as, as humanly possible, uh, those, you can start to self-fund the installs at like a certain year. Ten years. I don't. Even, I don't even think it took that long. But it depends, you know. So if the state program comes along and, and so yeah, it was yeah, it was more like in that. Okay. May I ask him a question? Um, sure. Does this Wait. require uh, uh, using spectrum as an example? Uh, spectrum to a TV service. They run their lines along the road, and we all the, the town is charged a franchise fee, which or the town collects a franchise fee, which Spectrum then rebuilds to us. Is there any beside the the monthly cost of providing the service, the operational cost? Is there an additional franchise fee of any sort, or is that LBC? They're sort of the owner or the operator of the system. We so uh, the the overarching app, and this is important. Uh, we do not do cable telephone. Tel we don't do telephone or cable television service in driving for a very good reason. I mean, first off, cutting the cable, I believe, is a legitimate way, and I, I think that's everybody's going in that direction. Um, but furthermore, we're staying out of regulation. We don't want to be regulated like a telephone company or a cable company. And uh, we do pay some amount as just a pure internet service provider to uh, USAC, the, company, uh, the organization you mentioned earlier, but it's a couple of bucks per customer. Um, but the uh, cable and telephone, like the cable franchise agreements, yeah. if we provided cable service, we would start to run into issues. We can't come into certain places because of franchise agreements. So this, this is not really a franchise at all. No. This because the town would theoretically own the system but manage it through this newly formed corporation if that's the route that you choose to go. It's more about the New York State Public Service Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, it just doesn't regulate internet. I mean, we, a lot of us pay a, a, a lighting district fee. We wouldn't be creating a new district. District service. So That's the anyone versus everyone. So, like, yeah. we're not going to make everyone. Thank you. That's, 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 um, thanks, Mark. Okay, uh, next slide. 
Oh, sorry, sleep. Oh, sorry. No, you're okay. <laughs> um, so financing. So the initial capital project, uh, there's state and federal funding. Those are the first two things that we want to uh, we want to go for. Honestly, your total project budget is not that large in comparison to some of these other projects that get funded through both the state and federal programs. So I think those that, that's where we need to start. And I think the New York program that starts in uh, 2024 is, is going to be a good place to make a lot of hay for the project. You know, you might not uh, get all your funding from one place, but I truly believe that's the way to do it. Um, Dryden did use municipal bonds. Uh, you could not use municipal bonding. I'm trying to think of what the law. We got a law passed in New York State to allow for them to bond for the project. Um, it wasn't. Uh, there was some kind of restriction. I can't remember what it was. Now I wish I was. Was that a bonding uh, for something that would cross municipal boundaries? There was a piece of that in it as well, but there was also bonding to provide. We we uh, our bonding agent. I remember it. Our bonding agency uh, wouldn't move forward without an express expression of it in the law. Like they, the law did not prohibit it, but they wanted the law to affirm it. Uh -huh. So we worked with Anna Callis to get that law. It put broadband on. Yes. And then I think there was an interim uh, a boundary crossing piece of it that is also in there, but I can't speak much to that. Um, the other thing we did in Dryden was uh, because of the taking on customers slowly, we utilized what's called bond anticipation notes mm -hmm. to extend the payments out, move it out as many mm -hmm. years as we can so that we're making money before we have to make uh, principal payments. Um, scope smaller projects in the first two years. This is kind of what I, I was talking about earlier. Can we scope a smaller project that gets more people to try to maximize that initial uptick of revenue um, so that uh, the, the subsequent build outs are all in positive cash flow? Um, and always be looking for grants and special, specifically infrastructure grants. There's a lot of infrastructure grants out there right now. Um, also separate the base infrastructure from the home installation. We talked about that. Uh, that allows you to not incur costs that you might never incur. Uh, you install the base infrastructure and then uh, the home installations are funded uh, as they go. Reduces the risk. Um, alternatively, you might bond for all that, which I think is a bad thing because you know, you're paying money on future prospects. Uh, and also just prepare for negative cash flow. And I'm supposed to say two years, but I think one year is the first year is the more realistic one. You're going to see negative cash flow there. And I think if you're smart about uh, the money going out the door, um, you can get up the cap positive cash flow in year two. Is it going to be, you know, the most significant positive cash flow? Yeah. But I think in year uh, three or four, you start to see significant money. Um, I think in the next slide, we kind of show a breakdown of an EBITDA. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the conservative take rate. Um, so you see negative cash flow in the first two years. Um, but then once you get up to where you take uh, a couple of hundred customers, you bring, you start bringing in significant cash flow. And there's, there's a really sharp breaking point because when you buy bandwidth, which is your cost of goods sold, you know, it's really the only thing that you're buying, like you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, that you're really purchasing. Uh, there's a limiting factor to that. Like we in Dryden, we have two 10 gig connections and that's going to suffice us for the first couple thousand users. And maybe we bring somebody else on after that as a third, um, but each one of those are only $3,000. So, you know, we're kind of playing this game where we're adding ISP slowly to account for the capacity. Um, but, you know, like, those those costs slow way down, and you know as you take on customers, that revenue goes up. Mm -hmm. yeah. So these numbers are your model, yes. your projections. Yeah, okay. I had a fifty percent take rate. I also ran a thirty percent take rate, um, and that'll be in the report as well. So okay. that's kind of that to me. That's kind of your bottom line of yeah. You know, uh, how much is it a month in Dryden right now? So that's a good question. So right now it's forty five dollars uh, mm -hmm. a month. Uh, for, and that's for 300 megabytes by 300 megabytes. So that, that kind of goes to your competition thing is because we're buying it, the raw stuff ourselves, and we're distributing it. 
we can give people this value that's just not realistic for others to provide. Now, Spectrum comes in and they come in for 50 bucks for a year for, you know, a couple hundred megabytes, something like that. And so, so that's why we dropped it down to 45 from 50, you know, to think, okay, we'll just get a little sticker shock. But that didn't, that didn't really affect the customers necessarily. Uh, and as a matter of fact, they end up paying 70 or 80 bucks eventually anyways. So, so how many years pay back 4.9 million? Say that again? How many, well, I'm trying to go fast so I don't hold the board up. <laughs> how many years to pay back the 4.9 million at $45 per month per customer, per asset, per projected customer? That's a different table. Uh, yeah. you know, um, I think we're talking about earnings, for that or, uh, earnings uh, before. So the the revenue room that we will have on that table right there will address all the capital construction costs as if, as if you paid for them all out of pocket by year 15. So if you get funding, that's just going to accelerate it. Which is the year. It sounds optimistic, but of course that's based on year. Bond. The number of customers to... and, and the bond too, really. Mm -hmm. Um they, they pay back. Yeah. Interest rates are up a little bit. Yeah, that's the other thing. That is yeah. Great. Ryan. Yes. You're, you're talking about <clears throat> new customers coming on to help build to this baseline percentage mm -hmm. or at least break even in year one or two, or something like that. You're looking at a static population, though, of around 3,000, 1,400 households. The town is embarking on a zoning law, and there are certain um, restraints on development. Have you used any projection on new development within the town? and how long it would take in order to uh, reach some of the numbers that you're... Has this entered into any of your calculations at all? Yeah, so uh, I projected the tape rate. So <clears throat> I do tape rate because it's a good way of projecting okay. things over time. I personally don't like to look at it that way. Um, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm just a simple guy. I like to look at it. <laughs> I like to look at... Uh, um, what it costs per month to run this thing and how many customers does it take to pay for that you know and and that's that's a good good way for me to keep in my mind is like a, it's an immediate target and then obviously if you add in your debt and your stuff like that that just it, it's going to bring that number up a little bit um and my, so i guess my thought of it is you can read a certain take take rate by a certain year um but i look at it in dry news we got to get to like 600 customers that's going to cover all our costs and what we have going out the door in the next year. And, and to me, if the population goes up, it goes down. I know they have 6,000 households, but I just need 600 of them to 800 of them. Um, and if they take out, you know, another bond to, to do any more work, I might have to get another couple hundred. Um, but I'm passing, you know, 500 in the process. So, um, I look at it more kind of how you put it to for, you know, earlier in the, in the presentation where what's going out the door per month and how many customers does it take to really meet that threshold? And then uh, obviously, you know, you want to get funding. Right, I, I can't see yeah. your remaining slides. You're going to get to um, Dryden, Caroline sharing that you mentioned at the beginning. Well, so if you go to, <laughs> yes, kind of. So uh, kind of is the short answer to that. I mean, part of it today is to, uh, you know, share this information with the board and have you guys chew on it a little bit yeah. and, and think about what the possibilities are. Um, because honestly, other than driving, doing their municipal project up there, there's no one else is doing this. So, yeah. you know, it's kind of, you know, Exciting. It's, it's well, exciting. it's exciting. It's exciting, but really it's exciting you know, there's, there's creative ways to address, or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to address these issues. So yeah. So the, one of the just one of the things that I was wondering about, realizing that from my understanding, Dryden is has projected soon to serve all along the Carolina Town Line, um, from what I understood okay. or what I read. Um, Will there be an opportunity for us potentially to get a jump start and say share that signal 
See what I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. The yes. uh, I mean, that's just totally dry, dry wedge set themselves up in a way where that is 100% possible. Um, you know, the only reason I kind of looked a little bit funny when yeah. I said the, the Carolina Mines is just because uh, we, we're, uh, we're, we're building out the village right now, so there's a lot going on in the yeah. project. But, yeah. um, uh, but that is definitely a possibility. And, and is, uh, did you want to add something, Mark? No, no. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. And I think, you know, the the question is how do we want to do it and how is it legal? Right. You know, um, I'm not an intermunicipal agreement expert. I know they exist, um, but I think we need to have somebody else scour over that to make sure that. Uh, but I think the law they just passed really sets us up nicely for that. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's for the lawyer, I think. No, I, because it was a preliminary question. I'm sorry. It's probably no, no, you're no. It's absolutely it's fine. Um, and if you go to the next slide, this is kind of getting into a little bit of that. So. These are Dryden's operational costs. Uh, I think the costs in Caroline could be very similar, and that's why they're on here. Uh, but the point is, is we don't need, we can split some of these costs for Dryden. You know, they don't all have to be incurred, and it could be a shared service between the two communities. Uh, I think you're going to want to keep your own maintenance fund. You're going to have your own conduit pull fees. And you're going to have your own miscellaneous costs, um, but the customer service and network management, you know that you you for for the money that is charged to Dryden per month, you still fall under that threshold of number of customers. Mm -hmm. So can an agreement be worked out to split those costs? Uh, and then the bandwidth is kind of the same way. Uh, can you just purchase it from them, or you know purchase your own? Uh, I th there's pros and cons to both. I mean, there might be a world where maybe you buy one of your own and your secondary is through them and they give you a good price. Um, or I would hope that they give you a good price. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, uh, essentially this, you know, it, it gets to be a static, basically $20,000. And you're going to incur inflation upon that $20,000 uh, for these different services. But um, what's the one price of bandwidth on the open market? 3,500 bucks was the best deal we got. And then we got a, another 10 gig from, so the first 10 gigabytes per second that we bought was from a company called Windstream. They're different companies because they're wholesalers. Um, and that that was given to us for 3,500 bucks a month. And then, and we went out to like a little RFP for it. Mm -hmm. And then later we we did another RFP and we got a little bit of Firthlight, who you might also know. Um, they don't do any residential providing, they do business providing. Um, and they're our second circuit and they're a little bit more expensive. Um, that's essentially what it goes for, 10 gigs, okay. less than 5,000. And, and all this will be laid out in the report that you're that's right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that includes IP addresses and right. all this right. other technical mm -hmm. stuff. It's just kind of right. too much for this. Um, cool. You know, and uh, about 300 subs subscribers will get you there almost. Uh, and the reason why I say um, almost is because like Dryden, we charge 45 bucks, 65 bucks and 90 bucks for the residential packages. And then we have business packages of 75, 150, 250. Huh. And if you average all the customers we have together right now, we have, it's like over a hundred dollars per customer that we get. Right. So the businesses seem super, like we take almost all the businesses because they're <laughs> our deal. We almost have too good of a deal. You know, I think that's part of it. We probably could have charged more to businesses. Um, and the residential ones, the hardest part about them is getting a hold of them and, get, and getting your face in front of them so that they can see your service. But businesses are easy to walk right in and tell them about it and I can save you money. Exactly. Yeah. What about things like Camp McCormick and the school district and stuff where they right. own systems? Well, so the school district, I would try to bid on their fee rate. You know, every year they bid out their internet services to all the providers. They say, who can give me the most internet for the cheapest price? And by doing that E-rate gives them a rebate. Um, but we would bid on that project. That's what we're gonna build and drive for all the libraries, schools. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what the other place was, but if it's like a well, State Division of Youth. Yeah, we, we oh, talked okay. about that one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure they apply for a similar yeah. program. If not, they apply for a program. Yeah, great. Uh, the, the next slide is really just a, a quick quick slide of dry. I won't hammer on any of this uh, too much, but essentially uh, our phasing ended up a little bit different for Dryden, um, but we got all the green built and we're beginning on all the blue in the north. Um, if you see the map there, um, 
And really the, you know, like I said, competitive oh, symmetrical speeds is another thing. We don't do less upload than download. We do 300, 300, 500, 500, 700, 700, gig, gig. Um, there's no reason for us to skimp on it. I got five. So you can more. see how that, that comes right just later, almost. Yes. yes. Almost, yeah. As a matter of fact, we have a couple of customers in the South that drive and we can't serve unless we come in. So um, we're going to have to come into Carolina no matter what. Just down on Thomas Road? There's a couple we talked locations. About, yeah. Sl uh, is it Slaterville Road, too? Yeah. 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 yeah, right uh, by Incomita. Yeah. There, there's certain areas yes. down where we can't go anywhere. Any other mm -hmm. way. Um, and again, we're operating in the free market and we're not restricting competition anyways. In any way, we're, we feel like we're just adding to it. Um, and then if you guys are wondering what that looks like, in Dryden. This is what I don't think you should do, even though I put pictures on here. Like I said, I'm proud of Dryden, but I'm the first one to tell you that if you need to do something different, um, there's a better way to do it. The two outside pictures are our huts. Um, one's in Freeville, one is on Pinckney Road near the uh, NYSEG facility. So we got good power there. Um, and then the central office is a hut we bought out of Alabama, used uh, those at a, a cell tower somewhere. Um, and, and our idea that with that, and we still do intend to do this, is uh, have it as a co-location facility. So people who need to connect their networks across the state and they need active equipment in between, we'll run we'll them a spot for a low cost and hmm. um, hopefully bring in some passive revenue. That's yeah. really the idea. Are, are you putting one up at Yellow Barn still? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I didn't have that on there. Yes, we have a yellow barn. Uh, and that, that actually is getting wrapped up construction like soon. Great. So that's what... Uh, that's what we run to Caroline out of, basically. On Yellow Barn Road? Or yeah. Yellow Barn Road. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, our cable goes north on Yellow Barn Road. We would continue south now. Okay. Great. Well, any questions? Yeah. Well, I do. We have a collar in Caroline. Don't say that. Don't say that. Caroline? Would I have a collar? Will you? Would you have a collar in Caroline? Me and wireless, we're not great friends. Okay. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, <laughs> what you usually want to do is when you build these fiber networks, no matter what, take your fiber to the tower because uh, there are folks like points uh, or smaller smaller organizations who will buy your bandwidth and resell it the same way we do it off those towers. Okay. Um, so if we can sell services at a tower, I'd love to do that. And we want more revenue for us. Okay. Yeah, I think they have to be a co-location tower in order to do it. Yes, yeah. But the other thing I was going to ask you is you said the public service commission doesn't have anything to do with the internet. Is there any? They don't write it. Okay. Is there anything in the works? Uh, or the future? Or they little? You know, you know, New York State. You yeah, know? Well, that's kind of oh, that's, that's, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, hopefully not. Uh, no, the regulation for telephone and cable really comes down to a lot of paperwork that I don't want to do. I mean, really, it's not. Much worse than that's not really serious. You have to pay into certain funds and different things, but it's just it's more of an accounting nightmare than anything else. It looks like um, we do some FCC filings for like Empire Access, it just is no fun. So there's no public service commission for you. Yeah, well, for this, they're great. I called them up and they're like, no, we don't, they didn't want to issue it. Was just okay. <laughs> but uh, I wouldn't put it past the law, right? Great. Well, this is thank uh, you. This yeah, is really sorry. exciting. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, this is wonderful. Thank so I, I really appreciate your um, thorough presentation and your fielding of all the questions. Thanks. It's uh, really helpful for us to understand. And all your work over the last few months and yeah. Yeah. meeting with so, us. So that's that's great. Great. Uh, you know, and if anybody has any questions, I'll... Uh, we got business cards I can call. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I get to ask yeah. about a business card. I'll spread them around, right? <laughs> I don't think I have one. When I get your report, we're, we're really looking forward to digging into it. And yeah. I'm sure we'll have more questions. I don't have a card, but I'll, yeah. uh, I can give you my contact. Yeah. 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 After you leave, I'll say the right? meeting for a little bit. I would think so. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 I, don't I, don't I don't think you yeah. want to. Yeah. Okay, you could, you could read the report too. It would be at the town hall. Yeah, I could read the report, but yeah. that will definitely answer the question. Since I'll be asking my questions on my own time to him, it really shouldn't perturb you too often. Oh, there might be a question here. Oh, do we have?
questions. I can't hear you. I forgot my card. That's all. I'm sorry, my little card. Okay. Are you going to stick around or split? I'm going to split. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks for right. right back yeah. to yeah. the Thank you. Great questions. Uh, all right. Um, I guess we'll uh, segue to uh, our delayed privilege of the floor. So I have Susan Barr first. So I had all three vaccines in one day and I've been in bed all day. I didn't know I had to fit her. It's just I'm kind of melting right now. But it's a long way. Um, so I brought in a memorandum for record uh, that we discussed at the meeting in February with Josh Shapiro. Um, we need to sign and return that. And a reminder that in Judge Fon's ruling, uh, although the keys were allowed, you could not still enter controlled areas unaccompanied. And that was in his letter, which I provided. Um, and also it was discussed at that meeting. So uh, the town has the key to the court control areas, but the court still controls the locks. Um, and we've gone round and round on this issue about secure furnishings. Um, but we've sent eight emails since March 20th. And the town has been unwilling to speak with us about this difficult issue. Um, and I don't really know what to do. Um, you know, if you want to go down the list of what we asked for and then what you provided and say, explain how it doesn't work, I don't know. But we need to find a way around this. Uh, and I don't see any way around. We need to meet. Um, and the fact that the town now has the keys, but that the things are, the files and the computers are not secure is actually a crisis because. Um, Defense attorneys can make motions based on the fact that the files are no longer secure. And people who have business in the court can sue the town because their files are not secure. So this is actually really important. Um, so I just really wanna ask you guys to meet with us, which we've been trying to do now for seven months and figure out a way how to secure our files and our computers. Um, and this is not something that we're just making up. This is federal law, and we have software that the FBI cares about, and we just have to maintain um, computer security and file security. Um, and I know that the town has stated that we're all friends, but to me, it's, it's like I'm a bank manager, and I just gave the keys to my bank vault to Jesse James. I mean, I'm nervous about this. And I think any homeowner would be nervous if some stranger had keys to their house. Um, but we have to worry about file security. We, and there's there's just problems about this. So I just request that the town uh, has been dodging this meeting, honestly, for, for seven months. We need to meet and talk about security. Well, I think that this is, this is prevalent to the floor. Yeah. Um, this is a conversation. That would and should take place in a with a, in a scheduled meeting with the town board. Um, I will say that we most recently did ask to have a meeting, and we were told that that we had no right to demand a meeting. We were simply replying to your request to have a meeting. So, but but this is not the venue to have well, a meeting. Words a lot. So we are. This is not back and forth. You made your statement. Mr. Murray is replying. So thank you. All right. Yeah. Judge Barr? Yeah. Are you available for a meeting next week to discuss the budget? It's not simple because we want to gather our three people. Then I, so you need this to, is a budget request meeting. Oh, a budget request meeting. Yes. Uh, Judge Reinbold um, is the one who's going to go to that. So you need to talk to him. Okay. We split up the list. Thank you. All right, uh, privilege of the floor. Uh, Frank Proto. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that last presentation. And also Derek's some kind of book. They were both <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, well, I got my <laughs> um, I'm here specifically to uh, 
just address resolution six. Uh, you're done uh, asking for the change order uh, of uh, second over $9,000 regarding community partners and environmental. Um, first, I want to compliment the town and the town board for <clears throat> addressing the need to upgrade the subdivision review law. I wish you had done this three years ago, along with the other uh, town regulations that in my opinion, require some tweaking. <clears throat> and this is again, my opinion under privilege of the floor. I think That's if true. you had followed what I just suggested in doing it three years ago, you probably could have avoided, which I don't think you had any intention of doing, but the consequence has become very apparent. You have a very upset population in the town of Caroline regarding the proposed zoning regulations. And I think you could have avoided the angst and the uh, major concerns. You, you have all been at meetings where there have been sadly some volatile comments, <clears throat> but and a lot of work going into that dr the draft law that at some point you'll be considering. I, to the best of my knowledge, you haven't approved it yet. You haven't, uh, you've been deliberating it. It hasn't come. Yeah, we, have, we will hold a public hearing <laughs> before uh, doing that. Yep. Go ahead. So my concern is this request for an adjustment is premature. It's an adjustment to the subdivision law. According to the resolution I read, it's to bring the subdivision law into compliance in the terminology in the proposed zoning, which hasn't even passed yet. So my suggestion is, and my suggestion, that you either vote against this this evening, or at the very least, you table it until you've had um, a thorough discussion and you come to some conclusion on the zone. Because I think the public, um, you, you've spent quite a bit of money already with these consultants, and I believe also with the attorneys. There, there's all kinds of information floating around. Some of it perhaps is accurate, some of it is not accurate, who knows. But and you guys have been under a lot of pressure. I know that. I've, I've been in your chair. I know how it feels. Try to cite a landfill in Tompkins County. So I would urge you not to spend any more money, uh, not to approve this tonight, but at the very least, just to table it until you've had an appropriate amount of discussion. And if some of you may have an epiphany and decide not to propose the zoning, who knows? But on the other hand, if the appropriate time to do this in the sequence that you propose, in my opinion, is after you have uh, a zoning law that has passed and okay. has not been deliberated. Thank you, Frank. I would respectfully okay. ask you to do that. I would have asked you to move this to the top of the agenda because some of us wanted to go hear President Biden speak yeah. on the uh, debacle that's going on in the Mideast right now. I don't know if that's still taking place because that was supposed to begin at eight o'clock. So, okay, thank you. If you have any, uh, if you have any consideration for moving this to the top of the agenda, I for one appreciate it. If not, I'll have to leave. Thank you. Yep. Hannah Wiley. Hi, I've got a couple of questions. First, I wonder if the town has any business on Hamilton Road right now of anything going on? Uh, so business? Um, I'm not aware of anything on Hamilton Road and privilege of the floor is usually not just for questions, but for information, but I no, I don't know. I don't know who else. Do you have a concern on Hamilton Road or? I do. Okay. Last Thursday, I was 
going to my parents' house and went to go check on my animals and Michelle Brown was blocking my gates with her car. And when I stopped, she took off. So I couldn't ask her what she was doing there. I don't know how else to ask. Oh, I was turning around. Sorry, I went down the wrong road and I was turning around. Okay. I was with do it. Seemed okay. I didn't know. Is that okay? Was you, I mean, it's you okay, right? Turn there. Yeah, well, I mean, I got. We can't have those gates blocked. You need right. To I was just there, turn, but... seriously just turning around. I was there for maybe two minutes. Okay. So, sorry. Could... I, sorry, it was alarming, but it was alarming. But... That's like me blocking your driveway. You know, it's like you would not kind of freaked me. It freaked me out. I didn't know why. What, what was going on? I couldn't. I didn't know. Sorry, turning around. Okay. Yes. Thank you. that all? Okay. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Uh, okay. That's all we have to put to the board. All right. Thank you. Um, move on to the meeting. Um, and um, so I will start with my supervisor's report, which is brief. Um, I'm happy to say the ECRUS project has been completed, um, reached substantial completion. Um, um, Mr. Spencer and um, our engineer um, approved that on Tuesday. Um, we'll note the watershed committee where there will have a, a committee working on updating the committee's webpage. Um, I took an opportunity to note that I have been working, um, on, I'm on the steering committee for the county code enforcement study for um, improving um, code enforcement services throughout the county and thinking about ways to do that. So um, I summarized this, they came up with six proposals that we're looking at. Um, and the one that I think is low hanging fruit and a great idea is centralized 911 addressing by um, County Department of Emergency Response and GIS. Um, that doesn't mean the town won't still have a responsibility and um, uh, assigning the, well, they won't assign the addresses. Uh, the, the county will determine what the addresses are, but the county will still be the town will still be working with residents in the co through the code enforcement department. Um, other ideas: shared permit and code enforcement software, which would help in the case of um, sharing code officers between towns at times of shortages. Um, Third item, creating a pipeline of, of code enforcement officers through recruitment and training programs. So, for instance, through TC3 or other, other uh, local educational institutions. Um, another idea, shared court presentment, which um, would be a specialized court for dealing with something that happens rarely, but is the, you know, if something comes to prosecution the sort of a specialized area of knowledge um, so um, that would benefit by having uh, a court um, ready to deal with those kinds of cases. And then um, centralized specialized code enforcement. So that would be like a specialist that would go around the county for um, the um, energy code or um, looking at um, large commercial uh, projects. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other one was a shared shared backup code enforcement staffing, which is, mm -hmm. I think, easy. Usually when there's a shortage, other municipalities are happy to help out. So mm -hmm. um, continued work on the budget and continued review of the zoning law. So that's my report. Any questions? No. 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 Okay. Move along since it's nine o'clock. I just had a, a not a question, okay. but uh, um, I'll take a question. My name is Kelly, and Hi, I'm, Kelly. Here, I'm petitioning to lower the speed limit on Coddington Road. Oh, yeah. I wasn't yeah. called forward for the privilege on the floor, but I just wanted to mention that I'm here for that reason. Okay. Hi. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah. You're welcome. Hi. Uh, okay. I'm glad to see you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. We do have a uh, pertinent, a, a relevant resolution. Thank in you. In that tonight. I'm very so. that. And it's good that you were here. You were here for Derek Arthbone's presentation, right? I was. Yeah. So that, that thank was, you so yeah. much. So we'll be telling him about about the resolution. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. <laughs> thank you. So uh, town clerk's report. Um, is there anything you wanted to offer from the town clerk's office, Velvet? Um, 
I don't think so. Okay. Thank you for your report. Yep. Um, <laughs> um, code officer's report was shared with us, his permits and things issued, and he gave us a, a year to date um, summary. It's nice. Uh, committee updates? Nope. nope. Okay. Great. Move along. Since time's a waste. Yeah. Um, yeah. What? What? Shouldn't the, the code enforcement officers report be public record? It's a public record. It's shared, shared to you, but you didn't share it. it, it it's a public record. Yeah. So. Will it be in the minutes? Um, it could be. Okay. Yeah. So we have lots of public records. And, so, and they're all, all in the minutes. So. Report. <laughs> nice yeah. yeah. Usually it goes into the correspondence folder and I'm happy to share it with you. Yeah. Um, do you want to uh, move a resolution do, do we want to move a resolution to adopt the battery energy storage law tonight? Um, what are your thoughts? My, my thoughts are that this week we got some very good suggestions from additional suggestions from the planning board, just making a few minor tweaks. Mm -hmm. um, I'd recommend that we <clears throat> make those minor tweaks in, in the text before we vote on it. Okay. So I just recommend that we wait until the next meeting actually to take, okay. take the vote okay. on the resolution. Just so yeah. you know, yeah. so that the ducks can all be in order so we don't okay. miss anything. Yeah. So the communications I, kind of I agree. <laughs> yeah. It's almost Halloween. So um maybe we want to go too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, was that a, a hint? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I actually had the same feeling. Um, and so that's why I didn't move the resolution because I didn't want to have to table it. So um, we will. I agree. We'll, we'll do, okay. And I, I also need some time to read through the comments some more. So, okay. Great, so I won't be uh, moving that resolution. Um, <clears throat> the companion resolutions, should we hold off on those two? That would make sense. Uh, so, okay, that's great. Um, so I'll offer a, uh, this is a ministerial resolution. So resolution to approve the 2023 and future amendments to the municipal cooperative agreement for the greater Tompkins County municipal health insurance, insurance consortium. And I'm not gonna read the, this is uh, something that we have to do whenever the membership changes with the health consortium. Um, so it's all, it's a, it's an annual tax. So this resolution not only authorizes um, me to do this now, but in future resolutions as well. I'd like to second it. So, okay, seconded by Cal. That's great. Any further discussion? If not, I'll call for a vote. All in right. favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? Great. Thank you for seconding that. And um, yeah. Offer a um, resolution to a request for the speed limit change on Coddington Road. Um, whereas the town has received numerous complaints over the years about speed of automobile and truck traffic on Coddington Road, and where the petition has recently been submitted with 96 signatures asking for speed limit reduction on Coddington Road in the town of Carolina, and whereas this rural road is bordered with residents and families with families. Their pets and livestock and is used by pedestrians and bicyclists, therefore be it resolved. The Caroline Town Board hereby requests a speed limit study to reduce the speed limit to 45 on Coddington Road in the town of Caroline. And further be it resolved, a copy of this resolution certified by the town clerk shall be sent to the Tompkins County Highway Department. Can I make a friendly amendment to that? Possibly. And to the Sheriff's Department. Yeah. 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 Sounds good. Sounds like everybody wanted to do that. Accept the friendly amendment. Second vote. So I'll just I'll just put Anne to the sheriff's yeah. Second vote. 
Great. And, and I got a second on that, right? Yep. Yes. And we're ready for a vote? Yep. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Um, I will offer a resolution for um, approval of the change order with community partners and environmental associates for update of the town's subdivision review law. I'll second it. Thank you, Kate. So, discussion. We did have a comment on this. So, uh, this is uh, <clears throat> this is simply to um, prepare the town to be in position. Um, if and when the zoning law is passed, the current draft of the zoning law, which I'm assuming that we will continue, has that law will take place will go into effect upon its passage. Um, we're trying to make sure that the that the current subdivision law um, is in sync with the recommendations made mm -hmm. in the zoning law. So this is simply to have the planner who's most familiar with the zoning law compare the two and make very some minor tweaks. Mm -hmm. um, frankly, this has already been budgeted in terms of our budget for planning for the year. Correct. It's simply a change order in terms of the kind of work that we're asking her to do. So I recommend that we that we pass this law, mm -hmm. especially to be prudent Res so that a re resolution, thanks. Prudent so that we're we have all the ducks in the order if and when we do pass a zoning law in the near future. And the money's already been budgeted yes. for but it's just a shift in yes. asking what what they're working on. Yes. I think it would also, um, I think with or without the zoning law, the subdivision would be they, they, like they, they, Yes, yes. So um, it just seemed to me that the, the price tag was quite high for minor tweaks. Well, it's, it's, I mean, the law. it's a law and it has to be thoroughly looked at in that regard. And we've, We've come to realize that that this planner will not overcharge us frequently. She has undercharged us for the work that she has done. So I have confidence that this is a high high figure and not a low figure. And I just want to reiterate, this money has been budgeted already. Yeah. Right? So, so this, did, this isn't a new charge. Yeah. No. In the resolution, I, I used the maximum amount in yeah. the proposal. So there were some optional items that were pretty much like what about asking the town attorney just to review if he thinks that there's things that are missing there that need because he sees a lot of municipal rules. Well, this is, I mean, this, the, the work that's being asked upon would be preliminary to the town attorneys then okay. reviewing any final document for legal standing. I think if he did the whole thing, it would be more expensive. Much more I mean, expensive. We'd, we'd have to pay him. I guess I share the sentiment that was bought for the privilege of the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we are we ready for a vote? Yes. Okay. So I'll Can call. we have a roll call vote, please? Excuse me? May may we hear a roll call? We're, vote? we're right here. We're voting. We're right here. Good. That's great. <laughs> so you can't yeah, know what the vote is. So Please. all in favor of this resolution, say aye. 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 Opposed? Of course. Nay. Motion. Resolution passes. That will be recorded in a minute. Thank you. Yeah. I kind of resent the back talk that's coming from the audience. I, I'm sorry. I, I think we've had privilege of the floor, and I yeah. I'm well, it's okay. Representing the back mm -hmm. so, so I would say plus privilege of the floor. Exactly. Okay. I agree. So I um I will mention uh, in our um budget consideration there one. There's um, the zoning commission made recommendations for updates for a lot of the laws, and um, there's a, a can you guys take your conversation outside, please? Please, it's not thanks, thanks for coming tonight. Glad you guys were here. So.
There's some kind. So that there's a, a code where all the laws are integrated and we'll send the code laws, don't they? for the town. So that would be a planning initiative too. I don't know if that's what we want to do now, but um, Guy did at some point mention it to me and you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just thought I mentioned yeah. across my mind. No, and, you know, it's, this one and, it's uh, good for us to take a look again at the uh, at the uh, zoning commission's report, which does enumerate which laws they think that we should pay attention to. Yeah. This was the most important. Yeah. This is the most timely one. Yeah. <laughs> there were a number of things. There were a number of, yeah. and I, you know, I, I think. Yeah. Anyway, we said it all in yeah. our comments, so I'm not going to repeat. Yeah, we just beating ourselves. Yeah, right. I won't be a drudge. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, my goodness, did I have a What did I do? Oh, here we go. I had requested it be done by eight thirty. Oh, um, did you tell that? Yeah. Oh, you got to go home. Okay. Um, I will. Uh, it's important that we're doing. What we're doing. Yeah, but anyway. Tomorrow's and, cheese day. I, I, I will offer the resolution for these following transfers. Yeah. 235578 from contingency A1990.4 to A1440.405 in Engineering Creeks. Um, this happened because of a discontinuity in the billing between the USGS and our annual budget. So we got over, we had to cover more this year. Um, and then 9940 from contingency to a 1440.406. Oh, this is the one, USGS. Um, yeah, the other one, the first one was just for the engineering services for Ecruz Road. Anyway, does that make sense? You guys good with that? Yeah. Yeah. Second. Second by Tim. Any more questions? No. Want a better explanation? No? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thanks. And then um, offer resolution to pay the town bills in the following amounts. A fund, $54,741.95. DA fund, $215,943.35. And streetlight fund, $358.62. Seconded. Seconded by Cal. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to say something just briefly. We've, we've been told by um, Jesse and other people that when there's back talk with people talking out there and having conversations, people on Zoom can't hear what's going on. And that's why one reason we've asked for people to not have the low hum of conversations out there when people leave people take the conversations outside it's because the microphone cancels. it's the microphone yeah so thank you for they, that they clarification yeah great um with that um i will make a motion to adjourn and make cheese <laughs> <laughs> all in favor all right. aye. aye opposed great Wait, 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 wait. Wait. Oh, wait. What? oh. we've got to approve the minutes. We've got oh, to approve oh, the minutes. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, now do we have to we have to yeah. ignore that? Um uh, oh. we ignore that? Do we have to start the meeting? The minutes are actually oh. um, they're not in here. So did people September have a chance to, to look at those minutes? And yeah. are they are they ready for approval? Yes. So we don't vote on the minutes, um, right. but I'll just say that the, the minutes are hereby approved. Thank you for you know, the opportunity to review them. So, Okay, and I'm sorry to ask one more question, but it was on my sheet. Anything about a budget workshop yeah. to plan? Well, good, thank you, Velvet. Next week, I, I was thinking of that. So, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank and you. Jesse cannot do Monday. Okay. Okay. And, and Cal is kind of... I can do Monday or Tuesday. So it's really down to Tuesday. And I will be out of town on Tuesday. Uh, so, I have a, so we just want to be here. That's well, 1.30 on Tuesday anyway. Yeah. You have a meeting till 1.30 on Tuesday? Yeah. Okay. But Tim's going to be out of town, so. Okay. I'm open on Tuesday. Um, 
I'm pretty open next week. I have a meeting or at, at 12 Thursday at one. So any proposals? I don't see we might have to do it with four people or three people, you know, just I think okay. it's I think yeah. it's <laughs> Should we just shoot for Tuesday? Sure. Okay. And Tuesday at? I have a meeting at two, on Tuesday, right? What, 12 okay. to 1.30. You have a what? I have a, I have a meeting on Tuesday from 12 to 1.30. Oh. So, um, what about Tuesday morning at 10? Is 10 o'clock good for you? Well, I'm not going to be here. Oh, yeah. I'm just trying to. Yeah. Or what about <laughs> 9 o'clock? Uh, I, I, I can do anything before uh, noon. Well, let's do 9. 9, Cal? Yeah. Yep. That could be a Tuesday. Ooh, we'll that's make it. Okay. We'll set a budget workshop right. Right. for Tuesday, whatever that date is, 9 a.m. Right, Velvet? 24th. The 24th of October. Velvet says yes. <laughs> Thank you, Velvet. <laughs> You're welcome. Smooth. Smooth. Now I'll make a motion to adjourn. No, second it. Okay. Okay. Only 924. Mm -hmm. 921. 921. Okay. All right, bye everybody. Bye. 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 Good luck. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Bye, Velvet. Thank you.